Okay. Uh, Erev Tobin, good evening, everyone. We are in Parshat Nitzavim uh, this evening and learning the Zerah Shimshon Os Days, section two in the Zerah Shimshon. Uh, he is going to start off talking about a Pasuk, uh, which I'm going to read right now. It is uh, in Perak Lamed, Pasuk Dalet. Im yiyeni dachecha b'ktei hashamayim. If you will be exiled, if you will be pushed away to the ends of the heavens, meaning if the B'nai Yisrael, when they are uh, sent away from the land of Israel, as is, is projected, will happen in the future, uh, and if they're sent so far away that it's to the end of the heavens, Misham Hashem from there Hashem your God will gather you, Umisham Yikachecha, and from there He will take you. So the Zer Shimshon is going to uh, focus on that possum. Again, O space. If you will be exiled out to the end of the heavens, from there Hashem, your God, will take you, etc. We should ask the question, should Tevas Misham Miyuseras? That the word Misham, which means from there, is extra. When it says Misham Yekabetzcha, from there Hashem will gather you, the word Misham is unnecessary. Shaddai Hayalomar, because it would have been enough to say, If you will be exiled to the end of the heavens, Hashem will gather you. It's understood that it means from there, Hashem will gather you. So we don't need the word. The Torah did not need the word Misham, from there. That's clearly understood and is, is unnecessary, the Zerah Shimshon is asking. The ode and another question, Mahu Hakefel, what is this double language or this repetition, Umisham Yikachecha? And from there he will take you. If the Pasuk were just to say Hashem will gather you in from the ends of the heavens, why does that then then of course we understand Hashem is going to take us back and bring us back to Eretz soul. Why does it have to uh, double up the language and say Hashem will gather you from there and Hashem will take you? From there, so those are the Zer Shimshon's two questions uh, on that puzzle. V'yesh Lomar, and we can say that I'm reading the Parakama de Megillah that we say in the first parak in Maseches Megillah, Ki Nipol Tipol Lefanat, when Haman comes back from being ordered by Achashverosh to uh, show great honor to Mordechai, so his wife. And his supporters say to him that if Mordechai is a Jew, they say to him on these words, uh, then you will certainly fall uh, in front of him. You will certainly fall to Mordechai, they tell Haman. So the Gemara asks, Why did they uh, repeat the word fall twice? Why, why did they uh, say the word that uh, Haman would fall twice? To him, I mean, it's bad enough if they told him you'll fall in front of Haman. Why did they have to say you will certainly fall in a double language uh, that Haman would certainly fall in front of Mordechai? Dorash, Rabbi Yehuda bar Eloi. So the Gemara in Megillah uh, brings Rabbi Yehuda bar Eloi, who says, "Malame, this teaches us Sha'amralo that Zeresh said to Haman, her husband, Umazu, this nation, meaning the Jewish people." Meshula le'afar, they are compared to the dust. That means in one place in the Torah, uh, it says that we will be, the Jewish people will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. Meshula le'kochavim, and we're also compared to the stars. In another place in the Torah, it says the Jewish people will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Kishahim yordin yordin ad afar, when the Jewish people go down, meaning when they are oppressed, they're subjugated, they go all the way down to the dirt. They go all the way down to the ground. Olin, and when they go up, when they rise up, Olin Larakia, they rise up to the Shemaim. So the reason we're compared to both Afar and Kochavim, uh, according to the Torah, is that uh, the Jewish people will experience in their history um, both the lowest of the lows and, and the most terrible of subjugations and also the highest of the high. And 
terms of what Zeresh was saying to Haman, she was saying to him, now that we see Mordechai is ascendant, Mordechai is on the rise, uh, Ahasuerush is, is honoring him, and Ahasuerush has commanded you to honor him, now that he's on the rise, there's no way to defeat him, he will go up and up and up, Adler Akia, up to the Shamayim, he cannot possibly be defeated, and therefore your downfall, Haman, is certain, and that's why she used a double language that he that Haman, you will certainly fall to Mordechai because he can't possibly be uh, defeated. That 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 is the point that she was making uh, to Haman. V'chein v'per kama de brachos, and so too we see in the first parak uh, in Masech brachos b'ma'arova eretzi lo hachi, and Eretz Yisrael they explain the pasuk this way, and we're going to quote the Pusik in a moment, but let's just see what the Gemara says. Nafla, she will fall. Velo tozi hole, and she will continue to fall out anymore. Kum besula Rise the besula of Yisrael. Rise up the virgin of Israel. So the Pusik that's being talked about is a Pusik in uh, Amos, in Amos, and it reads as follows. Nafla lo tozi Kum, uh, the the besula of Yisrael, the virgin of Israel, has fallen, and she will not anymore get up. Uh, lo, sorry, nafla, she has fallen. Lo so sif kum besula Yisrael, the besula Yisrael will no longer get up. Now that pasuk in its in its basic meaning is is talking about a period in, in Jewish history when Bnei Yisrael will not be able to recover. They will, they will be so um, in such a, a period of punishment, of onish, and of exile, that they won't be able to recover at that um, time. That's what the Pusiks actually talk about. What the Gorn Brocho says is that the Chachamim in Eretz Yisrael took that Pusik that if we change the way we read it a little bit, if we change the punctuation a little bit, um, then it will, uh, then you can read it as follows, Nefle that, that she has fallen and she will not continue to fall, whom does Israel get up, uh, virgin of Israel. So the reason is Er Shimshon brings in that Pusik is because he's trying to make a very important point, which I want to stop here for a moment to explain so that we can understand how he builds upon it. What he's saying is that it's not just the case that B'nai Israel will experience both tremendous lows and, and tremendous highs. It's that when B'nai Yisrael reaches a point of the lowest of the low, then it is certain that B'nai Yisrael will begin to rise from that moment onwards. And these two Gemaras, the Gemara in Megillah and the Gemara in is that Hashem built the world, structured the, the world and the destiny of B'nai Yisrael to be, that it's impossible for B'nai Yisrael to be completely defeated and completely subjugated. A lot of time may pass, uh, a lot of suffering may be experienced, but ultimately once B'nai Yisrael hits the bottom, so to speak, the bottom of the barrel, then automatically they will begin to rise again because it's impossible for them to, to stay at the bottom um, forever. And that's the point that the Zer Shimshon is trying to make from these two Gemaras, which we're now going to see how that fits together. And this, now with this understanding, this is what the Pusik is saying. If B'nai Yisrael will be exiled to the end of the heavens, the Hainu Ketzei Ha'acharom, this means the final frontier, so to speak, the final uh, point of exile, and there's nowhere further that the Jews can be sent away, Shekfar Yaradatad Afar. This means you've already gone all the way down to the dust. The Bnei Yisrael has been subjugated down to the dust. The Hainu Bidiyuta Hatachtona. This means the final uh, point. Shelo Tosif Linpol O. That you can't fall anymore. Misham. That's that word from the pasuk. Misham. From there, Dafka Yikabetzecha. From there, Hashem will gather you in. Shahare Az, because then we can say, Az Nomar, then we can say, Kum Basul As Yisrael. It's time for the Basula of Yisrael to rise up. When Bnei Yisrael hits the bottom again, then, then we know that they're, that they're going to begin uh, to ascend. Shahayarida Hatachtona, because going down to the very bottom, he Sibalalos Adarakia. It is a reason and a cause for Bnei Yisrael to begin to rise up to the Rakia. 
So that's why the Pusik said, and the Der Shimshon is going to keep explaining this, that's why the Pusik said, um, im nidach, im nidach mit le, le, im, uh, show me the Pusik one more time. If you will be exiled to the heart, then from there, from that point, from that lowest point, then Hashem will bring you back. And let's see the Zer Shimshon say that. And because the Jewish people are never exiled except through, in some way, through Sinas Chinam, and it's impossible for them to be redeemed unless uh, they reinstitute peace amongst them. Uh, we're going to see two psukim from Hosea here. Chabur uh, atzabim Ephraim hanachlo. One pasuk says uh, Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone, meaning that Ephraim at that point was so separated from the Jewish people that they were completely bound up with idols and therefore Hanachlo, uh, leave them alone. Hashem said to Hosea, leave them alone. Don't even try to bring them back. They're so disconnected from their brethren that you can't possibly save them. Uksiv, and it also says uh, later in Sefer Hosea, Chalak Libam, their hearts are divided. Ata Yeshem, now they will be found guilty which the Zer Shimshon takes to mean now that the people are divided and the people are not unified and, and, and uh, there isn't a way to make a reconciliation amongst the different people amongst B'nai Yisrael, then now they will be found guilty and now they will suffer uh, consequences. And, and so um, that, that shows us that when B'nai Yisrael is, is not unified, that's when the worst consequences are suffered and that's when a Geula cannot start to come about. Mishum Hachi Amar, and because of this, uh, in the Pasuk it says, Mitachila, at first, Misham Yikabetzcha, from there he will gather you. Why does it use this language of gather you? Yevarech Ozcha Bisholom, Hashem will bless you with peace. The Tiyu Kulchem Mikubatzim Keish Echad, and you will be joined together like one person. So the first step of redemption is for B'nai Yisrael to begin to be unified again, to join together, to, have, to this language of uh, kibbutz, of joining together. And when B'nai Yisrael does that, then and from this stage of being joined together and having peace, Hashem will um, take you out of the, of the exile. Vizehu, and this is the meaning of the originally we thought a redundant phrase of umisham yikachecha, and from there um, Hashem will take you. So the Zera Shimshon has answered his two questions. He has a lot more to say, but let's just stop here, pause here, and recap so we understand the answer to this uh, two questions. The first question was that the word misham from there seems to be unnecessary. He said it's miuseris, it's extra, it's superfluous. Um, but now we understand that the word misham is teaching us something very important, which is that Hashem is saying, if you, B'nai Yisrael, will be exiled to the furthest point, and they, can be, they cannot possibly experience more uh, punishment or more suffering or more exile, once they hit that point, then immediately Hashem will begin to bring them back, which is the theme that he developed for us from the Gemara and Megillah and the Gemara and Brachos, that, uh, that, that things are set up, Hashem set things up in such a way that when B'nai Yisrael hits the bottom, then immediately they begin to come back. There's, a, there's an impact and an effect of which they immediately begin to rise again. That's the beginning of the Geula. When they hit the worst moment of the Golas and it can't get any worse, that's when the Geula um, begins. So that's what the word Misham indicates. From there, Dafka, from that point of no return, that's when Hashem says, I have to start bringing you back. And in terms of his second question, the double language, Hashem said, uh, from there I will gather you, meaning I will gather you together and you'll begin to make peace and you'll begin to um, repair the damage of Sinas Chinam and you'll begin to build Abbas Yisrael amongst the Jewish people. And then that's the first step that can then lead to Misham Yikachecha. Then I can bring you back and take you back to your land, but only after you build peace uh, and unity amongst the Jewish people. So he's answered both questions. Now let's continue and, and go further. Vizuhi kavanas hamedra, hamedrish vishmos rabba, and this is the intention of the uh, medrash and shmos rabba, al pasuk on the pasuk, Moshe Hayaroa. This is talking about where Moshe 
um, was taking care of Yisro's flock after uh, he began to live with Yisro and Midian, and he uh, took uh, uh, Yisro's flock out. And of course, he we know the famous story. He encounters the famous burning bush. So that's what we're talking. That's what the Medrash Rabbah is talking about. Rabbi Eliezer Omer. Rabbi Eliezer says, "Ma hasne shafil mi kol ha'ilanos." Just as the bush that Moshe encountered is the lowest of all of the trees, Sheba Olam, in the world, kach hayu Yisrael shefeilim yerudim b'mitzrayim. So too, this represented the Jewish people who were at the lowest and, and, and most uh, down point in Egypt. L'fikach, therefore, nigla alei ha-makadosh baruchu v'ga'olam. HaKadosh Baruch Hu appeared to them and redeemed them. So the sne, which symbolizes so many things, this perspective of this is a piece in the Medrash Rabbah is saying that the sne, one of the things it symbolized um, was the state of B'nai Yisrael. Just like it was a lowly bush and everywhere else there were taller trees and everything was taller and more stately than this lowly bush, Hashem made the very unusual choice of appearing to Moshe, or having Moshe, speak to Moshe from this bush to say, this is the state that B'nai Yisrael is in. They're in a, in, 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 a, in, a, in a lowly and subjugated state. And apparently this is a, a strange thing. What kind of reason is this? Meaning, because B'nai Yisrael was at such a low point, why does that uh, lead? Why does that uh, tell us that therefore Hashem redeemed them? What's the connection between the two points? And what we just said, it all makes sense. Because B'nai Yisrael was as low as you could possibly be, Hashem needed to begin to redeem them uh, immediately, which is, again, the point, the theme that the Zer Shimshon uh, has developed. So we understand um, now what the symbolism of the Sneh means in this regard. And, and, is, and in this way, we can also understand a Pasuk in Tehillim. You redeemed with your arm your people, or you redeemed your people with your arm. That's how the Pasuk begins. We'll see the end of the Pasuk in a moment. But the Pasuk begins, you redeemed your people with your arm, the hule, etc. The the fact that the Pusik says that Hashem redeemed the Jewish people with his arm uses that imagery. This means that it was done mikoach hadin, through the power of justice, not the power of rachmin, not Hashem's midas harachmin, but rather Hashem was redeeming the Jewish people uh, uh, through midas hadin. And what is the connection between this, which again is just the first part of the Pasuk, Im Sofa Pasuk, with the last few words in the Pasuk, B'nai Yaakov v'Yosef Sela, the sons of Yaakov and Yosef Sela. What is the connection between that, that Hashem redeemed his nation with his arm, which Zer Shimshon means with the Midas Hadin, and uh, and then who who is his people? B'nai Yaakov and Yosef. They are the sons of Yaakov and Yosef. Uh, Sela. What does that uh, have to do? How does that connect? But Lama Hiskir Yosef. And why does this pasuk in Tehillim specifically single out Yosef? Halohu bichal b'nei Yaakov. He is included in the sons of Yaakov. So the pasuk just sort of said. Hashem, you redeemed your people, B'nai Yaakov, the sons of Yaakov. Why did it say B'nai Yaakov the Yosef? These were the sons of Yaakov and Yosef. So again, the Zer Shimshon has two questions, as he did in the beginning, uh, on, a, on a different Pasuk in our parsha. but now he's asking two questions on this Pasuk in Tehillim. And we can answer this question by looking at what the Mekubolim write. If it was not for the fact that Yosef was ruled over by his brothers before he went down to Egypt, then the Jewish people would have been stuck in Egypt forever. But since the brothers did 
rule over Yosef. They took control over him, and they, uh, and of course, we know what you know the, the whole situation there. They took control over him. They debated killing him. They threw him into the pit. They had complete control over them. Through that, the Mekubalim say, uh, because they did this to him, Tehila first. And afterwards, Yosef went down to Egypt and ultimately became the ruler over the Egyptians. Then this means that in a certain way, the Egyptians were servants to the entire Jewish people. The Ayan Od Asar Mamoros, and look more for this idea, this concept, in the Sefer Asara Mamoros. But let's just pause here for a moment. What's being said is that from a from a from the perspective of the Mikubalim, uh, it was essential for Yosef to be controlled and dominated by his brothers before he went down to Egypt. Why? Because once he went down to Egypt uh, and became the ruler over the Egyptians, he himself had been as, as if it were an Eved to his brothers. Now he's the ruler over the Egyptians. So he is, so to speak, acquiring the Egyptians for his brothers. So, um, so, the, so the Egyptians, this powerful, powerful world um, a dominating nation, um, from the Kabbalistic perspectives, they were all ruled over by Yosef. Yosef was ruled over by his brothers, and therefore uh, the Egyptians were uh, subservient in a certain way, from a certain perspective, to the Am Yisrael, to all of the brothers. Vizel Sha'amar Akosov, and this is what the Pusik in Tehillim means, Ga'alta Bizroa, you redeemed with your arm. The Hainu B'Koach Adin, which means Hashem was redeeming the Jewish people from Egypt through the letter of the law. Shema Shekona Eved Kona because something that an Eved acquires, his master actually acquires it, right? If you have an Eved and the Eved goes out and he finds something and he picks it up and according to Halacha, no one else can claim it, it's his, it actually belongs to the master. So here too, Yosef, who had been an Eved to his brothers, now he goes and he acquires uh, rulership over Egypt, over the country of Egypt, over the Mitzrayim. And so he acquires the Egyptians, so to speak, uh, as his subjects. Um, and, th and that means that uh, they have, the Egyptians have been acquired to all of his brothers. And so they are subservient, as we said, to the uh, Jewish people, to the Bnei Yaakov. And that is why, in the end, Hashem could say to the Egyptians or treat the Egyptians in such a way as if to say, you can't possibly own the Jewish people. It's actually the Jewish people who own you. Yes, it's true that for a long period of time, you were able to turn the tables and turn things around and get the Jews and enslave them. But from Me'ikra Dedina, from the actual legal perspective, um, it is the Jews who, who are ruling over you as, and, and have... Uh, the right to rule over you as opposed to you ruling over them. And therefore, I'm going to take them out from serving you uh, according to the Mirat Hadin. Legally, I can take them out and you have no claims or no legal reasons to stop them. The Im Tomar, and if you ask the question, if you ask why was it really necessary for the brothers to rule over Yosef, and that he should then go down to uh, Egypt and become a servant. Even if he went there himself, without having the name of an Eved put on him, and he became, let's say Yosef on his own had chosen just to go to Egypt and he had ultimately become the king and the ruler over them. Then the Egyptians would have been acquired to him. They would have been subservient to him. And they would have been the servants of B'nai Yosef. Truly, true, they would not have had any subservience or any, uh, any, any kind of um, uh, obvious relationship to the B'nai Yaakov, to the rest of the ch children of Yaakov, but they would have been subservient to Yosef and his children there to the B'nai Yosef. How you call B'nai Yaakov Kufufim Liyose? Because then the answer is that if that had happened, then all of the B'nai Yaakov would have been subservient to Yosef. 
Shehu levada yesh lo taina v'din lahotziyam lecheres. And he alone of all the brothers would have been able to have a legal claim, a justified legal claim uh, to be freed from Egyptian bondage and to come out to freedom. And that would not have been uh, from Hashem's perspective, that was not what was part of Hashem's plan. He wanted all of the Jewish people to have that right. And therefore, it was important for uh, the brothers to rule over Yosef first, and then he became the ruler over the Egyptians. And that's what the Pasuk means when it says, uh, and, and, and through this, B'nai Yaakov the Yosef Selah. Uh, the, the Hashem took out the Jewish people from Egypt at Bizro with his arm, meaning with justice, with the Midas Hadin, because of B'nai Yaakov, the Yosef, because it was through um, the B'nai Yaakov and, um, and Yosef together. He was subservient, they were subservient to Yosef, Yosef was subservient to the B'nai Yaakov, and therefore uh, altogether B'nai Yisrael uh, could claim their freedom in a justified way, and Hashem could take them out in that manner. So the Zerah Shimshon basically, again, just to kind of go back, what we, what we can take away from it is that even though the last few points went off in a different direction and explained the Pusik and Tehillim, the main theme that the Zerah Shimshon developed is one which is very important to reflect upon, that there can be uh, two, two points, that there, number one, that B'nai Yisrael can, can never be in a situation, Hashem will never allow B'nai Yisrael to be in a situation where there's no hope. There will always be, as soon as things get as bad as they can be, if God forbid they reach that point, there will always be a, a, uh, a redemptive and an ascendancy and an aliyah. And number two, that the Jewish people, the first step in, in reaching Geula and beginning the Geula process will be when we make peace amongst ourselves, when we eradicate sin aschinam and we, and we replace it with habas habas chinam, uh, and we unify and we join together, we see that's misham Hashem yikavetzcha, Hashem will join us together, or misham yikachecha, and Hashem will then take us and begin the geula and take us out of uh, gullus, it should come be meher and our days. Yashukoch to everyone for participating. And